Thank you, Patrick. And as Patrick just said there, we're now going to move straight on to our first panel, <clears throat> which will look at the impact of the pandemic and in particular, how the industry can actually recover from the pandemic in a better way. During the panels, you'll be able to submit your questions through the Slido tool. You can either do this within the streaming screen in front of you or on any device by going to slido.com and entering the hashtag, which is ASC2021. Our moderator for this panel is Edouard Chiofu. Edouard has headed the Air Operations and Aerodrome Department in EASA since 2020 and also headed up EASA's Return to Normal Operations project, which was the agency's initiative <clears throat> to support European industry and member states in coping with the crisis and recovering from its effects. Now I'm going to hand over to Edouard in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Ladies and gentlemen, aviation colleagues, thank you very much for joining the first panel of the day dealing with safety performance in ATM. Before the COVID crisis, safety performance of European aviation was at the highest levels, and the performance in the ATM was no exception. Ultra safe was a term that was started to be heard more and more. Safety first at that time was starting to lose its cachet as new topics like efficiency and environmental performance started to feature more prominently on various agendas. And we do have the numbers to prove that we were very safe. By absolute numbers and also by comparison with other modes of transport. While this could be seen as a measure of success and something that we can be proud of, Safety should never be taken for granted. Safety does not happen by accident, as the saying goes, but with constant pursuit and the efforts to improve. And then COVID-19 came, and it hit the aviation sector with an unthinkable ferocity. Since two years down the road, we are still trying to overcome and recover from it. Aviation and safety professionals don't like surprises. That's why we have rules for everything, that's why we build redundancies, that's why we plan for contingencies, that's why we train on those, and then we measure all those data points and analyze the trends and then ask for more data. When COVID struck, a system that was built for regularity had to adapt quickly in order to cope with an unprecedented level of disruption. The safety regulators were, of course, quite concerned whether those disruptions, coupled with the flexibility that had to be afforded in order to allow the sector to continue to operate, also compounded with all the other effects of the crisis on people or on operating concepts, will not have adverse safety consequences. And so far, safety was not compromised. And this did not happen by chance, but because we had a very strong safety performance to build with with sufficient built-in safety margins. And because aviation excels at safety and risk management, at the change management, and those tools prove their worth again in the context of this crisis. Europe's and the world's readiness for a crisis of this magnitude leave quite a lot to be improved. We shall review critically what went wrong and focus on increasing our systems and our sector's resilience. This was also the leitmotiv of the ICAO high-level COVID conference, and this was unanimously supported by, by all participants. But we should not only look at what can be improved, but also at what worked well and why it worked well. This is our foundation to build. The ATM system in Europe, as far as safety performance is concerned, is good, but is not perfect. That's why we should not focus necessarily on building back, but on building on, on this very solid and safe ATM system. This morning, I will have the pleasure of moderating a panel with four European aviation heavyweights that will bring their different perspectives on the safety performance of the European ATM system, and especially its evolution. I will start with uh, Josef Varadi, whose love affair with aviation started in 2001, when he became Chief Operating Officer with Malev Hungarian Airlines, later on within the same year becoming the CEO of Malev. Josef is the founding 
partner of uh, Wizair, and he stayed at its helm <coughs> ever since, since 2003, also during this most difficult crisis that impacted aviation. Joseph, with, with every crisis comes opportunity. How did Wizair use this period to enhance its network, its operation, and its safety? And what are your expectations from the European ATM system? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as it was advised by Mr. Hololei, we should be provoking so, so I'm taking that line here. Uh, well, first, maybe I should just start with Viser. Uh, Viser has been very resilient throughout this crisis. Um, we have uh, gone through this uh, um, uh, situation uh, quite effectively. I mean, obviously, when you are the, um, uh, the lowest cost producer in a commodity industry and you are very liquid, uh, you are in a very different position versus the rest of the players in the, uh, in the industry. We have not been immune, of course, but as uh, you said, every crisis is an opportunity. And since the breakout of COVID-19, we have been looking at the situation as, uh, as an opportunity for, uh, for Vizer uh, to emerge out of the situation, out of the crisis as a better business, as a more formidable competing force. And this is what we have been working on. We have invested heavily throughout this uh, period. Uh, we invested into, uh, into markets. Uh, today, Bizarre um, has a network of around 1,100 routes, of which 400 have been launched during the last 18 months. We've gone very agile uh, uh, to tackle uh, new market opportunities, making uh, investments on that basis. So today, we are a lot more diversified than than ever before, which obviously gives us a much stronger backbone for recovery uh, moving through this period and coming out of the woods uh, once this is uh, all behind us. Secondly, uh, we have invested in technology, in aircraft. We have uh, remained uh, probably the most uh, innovative airline with, uh, with that regard. Uh, since March 2020, we have taken 37 brand new aircraft deliveries and we have been bringing the best technology to the, uh, to the industry with, uh, with the deliveries of the AC-21 Neo aircraft. Uh, next year, we are looking at taking around 50 new aircraft deliveries. So we heavily invest, we heavily innovate, uh, which obviously makes a lot of sense from an economic perspective, but also it makes a lot of sense from an environmental perspective. Our carbon footprint will significantly reduce as a result of these investments and, uh, and technological advancements. And we also have invested a lot into people. We have uh, hired people, we have uh, acquired new talents. If, you, if I just give you one number, uh, last three months we, uh, uh, we hired over a thousand people, uh, which is more than 25% of the uh, of the organization. Uh, we are already ramping up for next summer. We think this is still kind of a roller coaster, uh, but, uh, but we should be able to, uh, uh, to, to go through this and we should be seeing a better um, set of operating conditions approaching the, uh, the summer period. But with regard to ATM, if I may say so, ATM uh, is, is a state monopoly. Uh, versus the airline industry, which is a heavily contested, heavily competed, uh, consumer-focused uh, uh, market. Uh, ATM uh, sometimes comes across as uh, a gigantic dinosaur in the, uh, in the system, and we all appreciate uh, safety, and I think this is the utmost importance in the, uh, in the industry. And to be honest, I think ATM has uh, delivered a pretty good uh, performance against uh, safety standards. I mean, you can always improve, but, uh, but it's pretty much there, and I agree that the foundations are there, and the question is how you move on uh, from, uh, from that point. But you also have to address some of the issues like sustainability, to what extent ATM is guilty for the, uh, the current sustainability performance of the industry, and it is. Um, we are talking about 5%, 10%, but there is a significant uh, stake over there. But it's not only ATM. I mean, uh, you also can see the same issues, especially with the legacy side of the airline industry. If, again, just give you a number, if Europe today was operated based on the Visa Air business model, uh, flying Visa Air aircraft, uh, the, the uh, carbon footprint of the industry would be 38% lower uh, than what it is at this point in time. So technology is important, and I think we all have to embrace technology and we, uh, we need to innovate. Uh, and, but also the operation of the technology uh, is critically important to make sure that we get the most efficiency out of it. And sustainability is a big deal. I think sustainability will loom over and will affect the, uh, the foregoing of the industry and we all have to position ourselves for, uh, for that. So I'm really expecting ATM to become more innovative, uh, more agile, to be in the forefront of bringing in new technology, uh, creating efficiencies and better productivity from the, uh, uh, from the industry. Uh, certainly we have to work together as partners 
uh, as uh, different stakeholders in the, uh, in the value chain. Uh, we, we have all the incentives to, uh, to do that. We want to see um, a, an efficient, um, um, uh, well-performing ATM system, uh, which performs well on the economic side of the equation, uh, on the organizational side of the equation as well as from a sustainability uh, uh, perspective. And, and you know, we'll do everything we can in our scope as an airline to, uh, to have that process. But I also agree that uh, there is a lot of political issues surrounding the uh, operations of the ATM. Um, uh, governments tend to be fairly territorial uh, when it comes to ATM operations, and we need to step beyond uh, that kind of a thought process. I also think that uh, ATM can be in incredibly uh, disruptive to the, uh, to the industry when they go on strike, and I don't know why this cannot be tackled more efficiently from a political perspective. Uh, millions of people's lives uh, get destroyed as a result of, uh, of strikes, uh, creating a lot of operational inefficiencies in the, uh, in the system. I think we need to get a much better handle over uh, matters like this, uh, as opposed to just pursuing some uh, uh, small group self-interest in, uh, in this process. So lots of issues there, um, but at the same time, lots of opportunities. And I really wish uh, all the stakeholders and all the leaders of, uh, of this segment of the industry to uh, uh, to do well, to improve and make a change uh, and reposition uh, the performance of the ATM system. Thank you very much, Josef. Uh, thank you very much for, for giving us a dose of optimism in terms of the recovery of the airline industry. Uh, it's, it's a long way and everybody has to play its part. We are here to, to bring up all these issues out on the table. Some might need a bit of time to be acknowledged. But to pick up the point that you said, uh, that some are behaving like, like dinosaurs. I have a favorite saying that dinosaurs were never ready to be extinct. So all that feel that they might be a dinosaur, be it airlines, being providers, being regulators, they need to evolve to remain relevant. Thank you very much. And uh, let's move to the next panelist. Um, he's Arn Schönemann, and he's the CEO of uh, DFS, the Germany's uh, NSP, one of the largest in, in Europe. And uh, Arndt is, is uh, another heavyweight with 30 years of experience in the world of aviation, especially on the manufacturing side, because he previously he was vice president of the German Aerospace Industry Association, and that he also, before that he also served with the Aerospace and Defense Industry Association, ASD, as member of the board and chairman of the Supply Chain Commission. Arndt, you are a courageous man to take the helm of DFS during the worst crisis of aviation because you are there for less than eight months. Before joining DFS, you are a managing director of a supply company of the airplane manufacturing uh, industry. Have you noticed any di significant differences between the two sectors, especially during this crisis? Thank you very much for this question. Indeed, um, I have to say that I was um, surprised about the differences between uh, the aircraft manufacturing industry and, uh, and the ANSPs. Um, I was working for Liebherr Aerospace, a system supplier for nearly all aircraft manufacturers like Airbus, Boeing, Comac, Embraer um, and, uh, and others. Um, doing flight control systems and uh, landing gear systems and uh, air, uh, air management systems. And I, what, what I've seen is that there is a huge uh, gap between the technology which is on board of an aircraft and uh, how um, you know, data are going to be managed in, um, in a way uh, on the ground. So that means the ANSP um, could do much more, could do it much better than it is done today. I think it's not the fault of the ANSP. It is a question of how we uh, evolve the system entirely. Um, I think, um, th coming back to your question with the crisis, um, it's clear that um, the aircraft manufacturing industry was down about 30%, and we in Europe, with air traffic, we were down about 70%. So uh, it's a huge gap between that what happened in the aircraft manufacturing industry and uh, that what uh, it is still happening uh, with us, um, looking to the air traffic in Europe. Um, North America, China, they recovered quite well with their domestic flights. Uh, we are happy that now um, North Atlantic flights are 
uh, coming back. So this will help us to recover uh, this crisis uh, much better than, than it uh, has been possible in the, in the last month. Um, however, we are still not back on 2019 levels. Uh, so currently we are about 30% behind those levels. Uh, that means, um, um, yeah, there is still a way to go. Uh, on the other side, uh, I have to say that the ANSP uh, could not react like um, uh, other players in the industry. So we uh, were not able you know, to close airspaces because uh, there are emergency flights, uh, we need rescue flights, uh, we need helicopter traffic. Uh, so there's, a, there's always a certain minimum level which an ANSP has to provide. So we cannot uh, close our business or turn it down uh, during the weekends or uh, uh, as it is possible may, uh, may, uh, maybe in other industries. So that means um, we made a rough estimation that uh, about 60% of the cost occur independent if there is one aircraft in the sky or not. So that means we have to provide um, critical infrastructure, we have to provide uh, such services uh, which, uh, which are necessary to, to have an open, uh, open airspace. So I think this is something what, um, what needs to be considered when we are talking about uh, the differences uh, in the system. So uh, we, uh, we were only able to phase out some, some, some people out of the system, um, uh, but now, um, and that's what uh, DFS, Deutsche Flugsicherung, managed quite well, uh, to manage the capacity that we are able now to provide the right capacity in in this recovery mode in this recovery phase we are in so i think we um, we have uh, still a way to go and uh, i agree on 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 Josef that there uh, must be a change also with the ansps and the uh, relationship in the with the aircraft um, um, industry uh, with the airlines and um, uh, we will see i think in the in the years to come a lot of um, uh, developments with regards to, to data transfer and uh, the usage of um, di digitalization and automation. And this crisis, of course, uh, supported um, uh, this development. So uh, there is a real push uh, on, uh, on those new technologies. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, it's very good to see that the airlines and the NSPs are on the same bandwidth when it comes to the need to advance and accelerate technological advancements. Now we will move to, to the next panelist. As, as you know, EASA and the member states work quite well together. And our next uh, panelist is Alessio Caranta, the Director General of ENAC Italy. Uh, he was previously holding a number of senior positions in ECAC like uh, Director of Economic Regulation or Director of Human Resources. He's a member of the Management Board of IASA. He's also a member of the uh, Provisional Council of Eurocontrol. And this summer, Alessio was elected as President of the European Civil Aviation Conference. Alessio, how did Italy manage the significant decrease in air traffic due to COVID-19? And, and how is it facing the return to normal operations? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Edward, and first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me today to be with you in uh, in uh, in this frame. And of course, good morning to to everybody. Uh, coming to your question, uh, during the first place, uh, the first phase, uh, which started in Italy at the beginning of February and lasted till mid March, uh, our first worry, of course, was related to the safety health of uh, ATM staff. If you remember at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, uh, due to the lack of proper medical information, COVID was uh, uh, dealt uh, as a kind of flu, a little more aggressive, but, but a flu. Then, uh, of course, uh, in the sense, uh, anavisionary providers uh, are used to deal with seasonal, with seasonal flu. So, uh, some mitigations uh, were already, already in place, but of course, uh, we will have discovered very soon uh, that the, situ the, 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 the situation was uh, quite different, uh, of course. That this, the, therefore, uh, there was a need to preserve the ATM uh, uh, staff health and the operational people in particular in order to maintain the capability of the system to provide services uh, in an acceptable way uh, in all traffic unit, unit, of course. And the strategy chosen by the Italian air navigation service provider 
uh, has been to divide the air traffic controllers uh, in three shifts, one at home, let's say, and uh, therefore uh, protected by infections, and uh, the other two alternating in, in the ops rooms, uh, just uh, like a lot of other uh, European uh, providers uh, did. And uh, all this phase has been managed uh, on a day-by-day -day basis uh, against uh, a very high, at the time for Italy, traffic that started to decline near uh, by uh, the end of, of February. Um, in addition, of course, every one of us uh, was worried about the compliance with the requirements uh, since they were mostly still, uh, still in place. But uh, in this phase, uh, honestly, we did not uh, uh, have uh, any experience of safety, honestly, which is good, of course. In the second phase, uh, by the beginning of the second week of March, uh, of course, the traffic was down. We arrived in Italy up to minus 99% of the traffic in respect of uh, uh, 2019 uh, figures and uh, this uh, situation remain until the end of June and of course in order to, to manage such a new situation a lot of operational change have been put, put in place and during this phase the main safety concern for us was to preserve the skill of the staff and of course to prepare the so-called uh, return of traffic which at the time was expected in, in autumn uh, 2020. Therefore, a, a, a huge safety case has been, uh, been set up, a so-called return to normality operation, uh, involving, uh, as you can imagine, not only uh, the ATM uh, domain, but all the aviation, uh, aviation system, uh, even if uh, due to, to, to the preponderance, preponderance of human factor, of course, uh, uh, the ATM domain was particularly crit particular critical. What was uh, a good, uh, uh, can I say, uh, a good frame where we uh, uh, had in front, in front of us? Uh, we had a very, very huge uh, uh, cooperation among uh, other vision service providers uh, throughout Europe, and it was uh, a very, very good, good tool to arrive uh, to have uh, a general uh, a return to normal operation system governed by, by EASA, and by the way, even today, the portfolio of risks uh, guided by ASA became uh, the present main guide for the recovery, the recovery phase. On this uh, basis, I'll not go through the technical aspect, of course, as suggested by, by Patrick this morning, uh, we prepare our uh, uh, plan to return to normality, and after the so-called, at least in my country, false, to sta false start of summer 2020 and the uh, new infection in the, in the autumn, we expect uh, the traffic between the 22 and the, 20 and the 23, going back uh, as previous uh, in 20 and 2019. Then uh, we work uh, on this basis uh, and we presented uh, our performance plans at the beginning of October uh, to, to European institutions. Uh, after 15 days, more or less, uh, Eurocontrol starts for publish a new traffic forecast that predicts the return to uh, 2020, 2019 levels uh, in uh, 2022 rather than the most conservative estimate in 2023. Uh, from an operational point of view, this means that the assumption contained in the return to normal safety assessments uh, will, be, will be put uh, to test uh, at least one year in advance in respect of the original uh, schedule. Uh, but I think, uh, according to the experience uh, done uh, in those months, uh, the Italian air navigator self providers will be able to provide all the required levels of operational performance in a, in a, in a safe uh, manner. At the same time, let me say that uh, we, uh, we perfectly know that in our horizon, we will still have uh, in front of us uh, the COVID. The COVID is not uh, completely uh, defeated. And I think a, cer a certain degree of uh, safe flexibility should be, should be uh, uh, retained. And from uh, a regulator perspective, I think uh, we still need to increase the level of activity to crisis. 
uh, in a way that the regulatory environment can be rapidly ad adapted to the changing condition without preventing, of course, uh, the timely adoption of mitigate mitigation uh, measures. Of course, uh, we are ready to face with any possible uh, evolution of the crisis, and uh, I think the experience uh, we had uh, till now, especially in uh, uh, way of coordinating efforts uh, among uh, Europe, uh, it was a very, very good tool uh, we have to maintain and to develop. So thank you very much for remaining vigilant and also for confirming and ensuring that safety was not compromised in, in Italy during this in the, in the very challenging times that we've been uh, and that they're not over it just yet. Uh, a lot of lessons to be learned out of those um, opportunities, but also areas where we certainly have to improve. Uh, we're moving on to our next panelist, um, is Frederic Delors. Frederic is, is a veteran controller. He knows ATM from the control room. He's been doing that for the past 30 years. For the pilots in the audience, you might have heard him on the frequency when transiting through the upper sectors of Hanover. Uh, not that much, perhaps, lately, since, uh, since 2020, he's the executive VP with uh, IFATCA Europe. Frederick, how's the European network doing from the AT uh, traffic controller perspective? Well, Edward, uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you, first of all, for inviting uh, IFATCA, the uh, professional and technical voice of more than 50,000 air traffic controllers, the ATCOs, uh, globally, including 20,000 air traffic controllers within the European region. It's truly a pleasure to, to participate to this event at ESA. So thank you very much to all the ESA team for the organization. Now, your question actually brings uh, uh, a lot of potential. And um, allow me first to say that the Europe network has been robust and resilient. Um, that would be a short answer. Um, after the rapid and uh, deep drop of traffic the global aviation system experienced in spring 2020, the air traffic controllers are looking forward to a stable and gradual recovery. Having said that, for some providers uh, it would be easily, um, for others it might be a little bit more complicated um, to get back to normal operation. It's, uh, and this I would like to confirm to Josef that it's always an embarrassment for the ATCO not to be able to meet the capacity request. The uh, air traffic controller take pride in reducing delays and safety is always our number one priority. From the, the, from the discussions uh, held with our member associations, we realized that uh, some measures implemented will have consequences and they will have to be dealt with. Some tensions do exist, it's a fact, only through sound and professional dialogue will these tensions be solved. With the example of summer 2021, it already got complicated in uh, some areas. The limits experienced in 2018 and 19 regarding capacity could uh, quickly become uh, an issue during the upcoming recovery. So not recruiting ADCOs and other staff during the crisis even terminating uh, trainees in the final phase of their training will not help in the near future. The professionalism of air traffic controllers did allow and will allow us to keep the highest safety standards uh, in Europe. During the crisis, all service continued and we shall be happy and grateful for this. So overall, the network is doing fine. But in our perspective, in our view, we are at a Byzantine moment. We see the exhaustion of uh, past models. We need to reach for a new dimension. So this means for us, we need to manage the network by a single source. In IFATCA's uh, opinion, this can only be achieved by a reorganization of the ANSPs in Europe. Indeed, Defragmentation has been high on our agenda to achieve higher performance and resilience. Today, more than ever, when we see the issue with the climate change, we need to work together to reduce the CO2 emissions by all possible means. A streamlined communication navigation surveillance infrastructure is needed. Harmonization of ATM support systems. 
an economic model with flexible user charges, allowing long-term air traffic control staffing and investment, and EASA, EASA working for safety, and a truly powerful network manager with an enlarged role in environments. Environment cannot be tackled at tactical level. It needs to be dealt with before by having contracts between the network manager and the service providers uh, up front, and then they will need to deliver on these contracts. Indeed, the European network is doing fine and it could be better. New challenges call for ways of delivering operational services for the essential infrastructure. We can achieve this and we can achieve it for the benefits of all. Frederick, thank you very much and thank you all for the very good and insightful points. I would like now to dive a bit deeper in a number of, uh, of topics and, and to pick up where Frederick left it. Um, yes, it, it seems that we're all in, in agreement that the system was resilient, robust and withstand the, the challenges that the crisis has thrown at it. But we are not here to really pat each other on the back, and to, but more to look at what we need to, to do in the future. Uh, and I, I will start with a, with a very dear topic. I think it's here for the past 20 years, uh, and it's fragmentation. We saw in the context of the uh, COVID crisis that aviation at European and, and international level was quite good at rallying together. <coughs> but looking at Europe, it didn't help to the fullest extent uh, possible because of the patchwork of, of national measures that have been instituted uh, in, in the fight against the pandemic. There is a lot of fragmentation is in, in ATM. We know that for a long time. Uh, and it's perhaps when thinking about building back better, how do you see the European ATM system evolving in the future? Mm -hmm. I will start with the, with the one at the center of, of, of it, with, uh, with Arndt from a, from a DFS perspective. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for, uh, for this very good question. And uh, indeed, there is room for improvement when we are thinking about um, this uh, fragmented landscape we are in. Um, DFS, together with um, so the German ANSP, together with their colleagues of uh, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, are already working in the upper airspace in Maastricht. Um, that means the um, upper air, Maastricht upper airspace control. This could be a very good example to be extended, maybe to think about you know, a common uh, company uh, um, uh, making out of uh, this collaboration, which is today under Euro control, um, to get a more commercial view also in the future. And I think this is something what, what uh, could be considered maybe in, 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 the, in the years to come. So um, there is room for, for such an improvement. I think also there is, uh, um, you know, if you have a look to the, the suppliers landscape, um, the systems which are developed by the ANSP themselves or their system providers, um, you know, um, Sometimes I have the impression that the system is sold to us in yellow, to the next one in green, and to the, the next one in blue, and uh, it's uh, all the same uh, behind that. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a money-making machine, and uh, I think this could be harmonized much better um, within the, uh, the European ANSP. So there is a, a lot of um, room for, for improvement, and I think automization and digitalization, so the, ca the capacity which needs to be managed in the future will drive such um, closer collaboration uh, between the, the ANSPs in the future. Um, Again, I, th I think uh, starting maybe to consider in the upper airspace a much uh, wider collaboration as we have it uh, today could be maybe a first step. Um, uh, I, I will take also another point uh, from Frederick, you know, the, the charges system. Uh, so how um, uh, air traffic um, management is uh, charged to the airspace users. It doesn't work today properly. So uh, we need to uh, reform that and we initiated this discussion uh, already about that maybe to, uh, to be solved within a new regulatory period. So RP4 could be maybe a, um, a, a time uh, to implement um, a new charging system as well which is uh, much fairer to everybody in, in the system. And I think um, step by step doing such um, 
uh, developments in, in, in the future, uh, we will see a much closer collaboration. Um, and uh, the network manager, by the way, uh, which we have in, in Eurocontrol, is doing a fantastic job. And uh, this also needs to be extended uh, to a certain level. Um, but uh, how, the, how the capacity management is uh, taking place today is already in a, in a, in a very good shape. And uh, not to forget maybe one point, uh, we have the functional airspace blocks uh, in Europe, which um, are a state initiative. Um, so DFS is in FABEC, uh, Functional Airspace Block Europe Central, and we are constantly uh, talking about how uh, we could improve the collaboration. So I, I think uh, we will see a lot of steps in the near future. Thank you very much, Arndt, for, for your optimism and uh, your trust in technology. Uh, and Josef, it's you doing the zigzagging now in the European skies. Um, how will you see the, let's say, reduction of fragmentation having a net benefit on environmental and safety performance? I must say that I'm a, a, a bit less optimistic, um, uh, simply because I think it goes beyond sort of the professional boundaries of the, uh, of the system. Uh, it requires a change in political will and a different attitude by uh, by governments and, uh, and the whole European regime. I mean, we might be praising ourselves how well Europe has been coping with COVID-19. I think Europe has been a zoo. It, it's been a complete mess. I mean, we couldn't even define the terms how we measure COVID-19, whether that's a traffic light system, whether we apply tests or vaccination, etc. It is only just now in recent uh, uh, months that uh, it seems that Europe is creating a pass with vaccination and allowing uh, air travel to, uh, uh, to resume, but it's been uh, an absolutely unpredictable uh, kind, of a, kind, kind of a zoo. And to some extent, uh, the, the principle of national interest, uh, if you wish, uh, applies through the, um, uh, the ATM uh, system as well. So I think the real change will come when, uh, when the, uh, the single European sky is going to be considered seriously. Uh, and not only from a professional perspective, but also from a political perspective. Uh, that requires uh, unity of, uh, of Europe. Europe has not done too well on anything uh, uh, to unite. Uh, and we'll see whether this is going to happen on this field uh, or not. So I think it is a very challenging issue from a conceptual perspective. I mean, I mean, we have great guys here. I mean, I mean, I mean you gentlemen are, are, are very, very groomed and trained leaders and professionals of this, uh, of this industry, but you are put in a framework. And the question is how that framework is going to change, allowing you to, uh, to really uh, uh, ripe efficiency from the system. It's got to happen because uh, sooner or later Europe will lose its, uh, its competitiveness versus the rest of the world. I mean, if you look at China, if you look at the, uh, uh, the North American systems, I mean, we are far more complicated, far more expressive, uh, much less efficient than, uh, than some of those systems. And we have to up our games and we need to, uh, uh, to come up with breakthroughs. And I don't think this is just a kind of an evolutive process. Uh, it, is, it, it is almost like a revolution that you have to, uh, to change the framework and uh, it is a legal issue as well as a political issue, uh, how, to, uh, how to do that. But we need to, we need to see the ATM system um, uh, to become uh, more efficient. Uh, the industry is going to be under pressure, not only from an economic standpoint and from a global competitive standpoint, uh, but also from an environmental and sustainability standpoint. And we need to find every 5% and 10% to reduce the footprint of the industry. And, uh, and the ATM system has a role in that, uh, a significant role in that. Uh, not only that, I mean, I think we are all into this, so we are all stakeholders and every, uh, every player has to have uh, a credible plan how to contribute to, uh, to, to this development and we all should take this uh, very seriously. And then from a safety perspective, I would also say that uh, uh, ATM is a very uh, a fragmented system at this point in time, but just imagine, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years down the line when uh, the industry is going to be flying unmanned aircraft, how do you deal with that one, uh, which will put uh, an incremental level of pressure on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the ATM system. And I think that's going to be coming. I mean, you can see the, uh, uh, the unmanned technology kind of spreading around the world in, uh, in many different fields. I think it's just a matter of time when it's going to spread into aviation as well and see you flying and you need to deal with it. So it's not only the efficiency side of the system is a challenge, but it also the safety side will get challenged over time. And you need to get ready uh, for that. Uh, but that requires fundamental changes in the legal framework and also in the political attitude. Thank you very much, Josef. We'll, we'll come back to the issue of, of technology. And I, I agree with you, it's, it's not a legal or even a, a technological uh, challenge. It is also first a political one where Europe has to really rally together as one. 
uh, we, we can certainly do a lot better judging from the previous experience in, in tackling the, this crisis. And that's why I think this, this conference should be there here to, to convey this message. Uh, I would like now to dive further into, into another topic that was also alluded in some of the interventions in, in the first part on, on our resilience as a system. Uh, this is certainly not the first crisis we had in aviation, perhaps the biggest, uh, but also for sure will not be the last crisis. Certainly it's not that easy to, to, to guess what the next crisis will be like. Uh, I think cyber is an, is an area where everybody's looking with interest and, and apprehension, was also mentioned by uh, Mr. Holulai. And of course, with our increased digitalization, the system exposure is increasing. And my question is, how are you, in, in all your domains, increasing your overall crisis resilience? And especially, what are you in doing to increase your, your cyber resilience? Perhaps with, uh, with Arndt again? <clears throat> yes, thank you. I think um, you are absolutely right, Josef. Um, we will see in the, in the years to come a tremendous development towards um, unmanned technology. So first on the military side and then step by step also in the commercial um, uh, uh, environment. Um, and of course, we need to integrate uh, drones. So th this means the management of data becomes key and if we if we want to manage data, so we need to, to work with cloud-based technologies, we need to work with satellite-based technologies, and it means, of course, that we need to tackle this problem of, uh, of cybersecurity very much. So, um, and there, standards are needed, regulation is needed, so we need a clear set of uh, how to, to work together within the European ANSPs, not to to, to uh, you know, lose competition towards uh, that what's uh, going on in China, that, that what's going on in the US and in North America, for example. So there is a lot of things, uh, there are a lot of things which we need to, to do. Um, and um, I think there will be a spillover from military to, uh, to civil uh, based systems. And uh, so we need to bring together the entire community uh, to work on, um, yeah, on, on, on such uh, standards. And I think EASA can play a significant role in that. Thank you, Art. I, I would remember, I would recall that also resilient, crisis resilience is, is something that features quite high on the agendas of, of regulator and especially cyber resilience. So, Alessio, how do you see this from, uh, from the perspective of a regulator in Italy? Well, I think in the first place, uh, if uh, this uh, experience uh, has learned something to us, uh, it is that it's quite impossible not to afford it in a uh, comprehensive way. The first approach to COVID was really fragmented uh, among the various sectors, of course, and we need to have uh, one single uh, mind uh, to take into consideration everything, not only ATM and assistance, but even airports and line, airlines and, and, and so on. Oh, why? Because uh, we have uh, in front of us uh, a, a real fast uh, technological development. Uh, this morning, in his brief intervention, uh, uh, Patrick uh, talked about uh, drones, uh, uh, advanced air mobility, and urban mobility, support with the flights, uh, and, and other topics like that. We oblige us uh, to, to run from the legislative point of view behind uh, the technological development. Of course, uh, in this sense, uh, I think cyber uh, resilience uh, will increase uh, its importance at the same rate of digitalization. No, no matter of that. However, I think at the same time that the need to be cyber resilient uh, uh, is not confined to aviation sector. I think, uh, or in particular to ATM domain, of course. I think, uh, first of all, it should be include all aviation domain, first of all, and then it should be part of a more general uh, approach from uh, a state point uh, of view. Uh, not only involving for the military aspect of, uh, of the problem, but in general terms, uh, all the uh, evolution that could be uh, seen uh, at national level. Of course, uh, from my point of view, in ATM uh, domain, it is extremely important that the technical standard has issued 
uh, enough in time to influence the design and development of the systems because otherwise uh, we will have uh, at a certain point of our development clash between the necessity to be cyber resilient from one side and the necessity to implement uh, new tools for the uh, governance of our ORC. So I think it's, it's extremely important uh, in the sense uh, to build the architecture of the ATM of the future. Thank you, thank you, Alessio. And, and Frederick, how is, let's say, crisis resilience for the human in the system, for the controller? Well, for the human in the system, uh, the, the best uh, barrier we can, we can have is, is uh, awareness and, uh, and training. Um, I mean, I join, of course, uh, what Alessio and, and Anna have said. Um, we, we are an essential infrastructure. We cannot afford to have prolonged failure. It's not possible for us. So we, we need our people to, uh, to be actually well-trained on uh, mitigations, uh, whatever this can happen, in order to reduce as far as possible the impact on the overall system. Um, then thereafter, from an, from an air traffic controller perspective, um, the only way we can do, and as fast as possible, is apply the clear uh, sky procedure, which is basically to bring everybody safely down as fast as possible. And then the rest will have to hope that the systems will come back as quickly as possible. Thank you. Of course, we want to keep the aircraft flying in the air rather than on the ground, only in this emergency situation. Josef, how is, from Wizard's perspective, crisis resilience being tackled? Well, personally, I think cybersecurity, if you really think about this, uh, might be the single biggest issue we are facing going forward. I mean, if uh, there is ever going to be a third world war, uh, it's not going to be striking rockets or shooting bullets. It's going to be, I think, in the cyberspace. Uh, and, uh, and we need to do everything to, uh, to protect our systems, our uh, procedures and our and our operations and clearly uh, we have vulnerability. I mean you've you've seen cyber attacks happen into the industry in uh, in different segments. Uh, cyber has been seen more of a consumer issue, uh, more of a human right issue so far, but I think it's a, it's a much bigger deal than that. Uh, it, is a, it, it is an operational matter. It, it can be a systemic error, it can be a systemic problem uh, should it become uh, very serious. And uh, I think we as an industry have to be incredibly focused on cyber security. And maybe this is an area where we can do better coordinated, united, uh, all together as opposed to just trying to figure out uh, solutions uh, one by one, company by uh, company. So if there is a scope for working together uh, as an industry as a whole value chain uh, of the industry, I mean, I think cyber security is, and this is like a, uh, flight safety. I mean, uh, flight safety is essential. Uh, cyber security is essential too, and it's going to be uh, challenged in the uh, in the future. And uh, and we need to see how this can be best tackled. Whether this is through uh, a, a central framework or uh, or or more informally or through legislation, but. Uh, uh, but it is it is a big deal, and we need to we need to look at that, and we need to join forces to uh, to tackle cyber security. Thank you. So stronger together is is the way to go. Uh, I would like to move now to also a topic that came quite frequently in many of the intervention uh, dealing with innovation in, in aviation. We've seen with this crisis that the crisis is a great accelerator. And, and also it's, these are very exciting times to be in because there's a lot of very fast happening uh, disruptive innovation taking place. Digitalization was mentioned by everyone, but we see also the advent of electrical propulsion, VTOLs, drones, new operating concept making more and more use of um, auto increased automation in the cockpit. All these new concepts will develop and coexist for some time with the legacy technology. And they will be a challenge for all of you. I'm, I'm sure of that. How ready are you for the future and for all those challenges? I will start with uh, perhaps with, with uh, Frederick because also the, the human in the system will also be impacted by technological development. Well, for, for IFATCA, and I'm speaking uh, from a global perspective, uh, we believe that a transition to a fully integrated and automated uh, interaction between all the players um, will need to be done incrementally, uh, in incremental steps. There will not be any, uh, any big bang. Uh, it, it's hard work to, to understand 
and integrate new systems. It's a fact. Um, it still needs to remain a human-centered uh, system as well. So additional staff will be needed to ensure the transition because we don't only need to, to ensure that we provide the highest level of performance and safety in the now system, but in the meantime, we need enough staff in order to be able to implement the future developments. So an only an harmonized approach will provide the necessary regulatory framework to process to a successful implementation um, of some of the divisions that we've seen uh, developed in the last years. And, and there we need ICAO, we need EASA, but we also need Eurokai to assist in building robust foundation for the future system. We need absolutely to have agreed and common standards. So an orderly development, this yes. is what you want. How do you see it, Alessio, from a, from a regulator perspective, keeping up with the development in was one of the biggest challenges for regulators? Yes, I can easily share the Italian experience in, in this field. Uh, we are working a lot uh, in, uh, in these new technologies. Uh, one month ago, more or less, we approved in our board uh, the Italian, uh, let's say, strategy in the field of urban uh, air mobility. And imagine what could be the future uh, of this new tool uh, in changing the way of moving ourselves, uh, in, uh, even in town. Uh, Last year, we had the first trial in, in Rome uh, moving uh, uh, organ materials, uh, organic materials, uh, so, so it was a real transport between uh, an, airport, in, 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 in an hospital located in the center of the town and another one uh, near, near the seaside, uh, of course, in a segregated area for the time being. And it was a, a great successful, and it was a quite uh, uh, important information we got uh, from this, uh, this experiment. Next year, probably, we will uh, uh, go beyond uh, imagine to develop, uh, of course, on a trial basis for the time being, uh, um, transportation between uh, the airport of Fiumicino and the center of Rome with an electric machine, of course, without passenger on board for the time being, but with the aim to develop as soon as possible this new kind of, uh, of transportation uh, mean. Of course, uh, I agree with Frederick, we need to have uh, a common approach at the European level, at least uh, having the same rules uh, to, be, to be applied. And uh, of course, uh, we are ready to participate uh, with EASA, but also with the European Union to develop uh, such a new uh, legislative or regulation frame, let's, uh, let's say. But I think it is uh, uh, our, our own future. And uh, if you, we go back to 10 years ago, maybe we couldn't imagine uh, uh, how fast wo was the development of the drone uh, activities. Uh, today, when uh, we talk about uh, urban air mobility or suburban flights, it seems something uh, very far from us, but uh, uh, honestly, in some instances, uh, we could consider even yesterday, and we are here in order to develop uh, a common legislative or regulation frame where any one of us uh, uh, could uh, uh, ordinarily uh, move uh, itself, and uh, I saw with great. I, I, I listened with great interest this morning, uh, Patrick Key, when he announced something uh, going on uh, in EASA in terms of a certification of a, a tool governing this kind of uh, urban uh, development. Let's say. Thank you, thank you, Alessio. Joseph, uh, assuming that Wizzair will not start uh, anytime soon in, in the world of drones, but you'll be sharing the airspace with them, and you already alluded to that. How do you feel that the ATM system is ready for this innovative operating concepts happening around you? I mean, clearly, as it's been said, um, the ATM system has to be uh, innovated. Uh, it needs to be um, transformed into a, a different technological platform to be able to deal with the uh, 
uh, the rising complexities because I think complexities will be rising uh, and I, I agree that it needs to be a, a very coordinated approach and probably there is going to be a transition period uh, to, uh, to go through. I mean some major disruptions I think will happen to the industry, the unmanned technology, uh, the different level, levels of the airspace, uh, how, how to be used. I mean, you know, one of the issues we are seeing uh, currently is that in, in, in a number of areas, uh, uh, civil acrobatic flying and uh, gliders, etc., can disturb the airspace in a way uh, that it's almost like waiting for disaster uh, to, uh, to happen. So lots of issues to be, uh, uh, I think, to be, uh, to be sorted out. Uh, and that's the ATM side of the equation, but I think we on the uh, airline side of the equation uh, are also facing some significant challenges. I mean, the single biggest one in the next uh, 10 to 20 years will be the decarbonization of flying uh, uh, technology. Uh, and uh, as far as we are concerned, we want to be in the forefront of those developments working together with the OEMs to make sure that uh, uh, the, the next technology is properly defined and you know, as a significant operator we can, uh, we can contribute to that, uh, to that development. And we would love to do it uh, with the ATM system as well. I mean, we are a significant operator in, uh, in Europe and uh, I think our long-term strategic interests are aligned. I mean, we want ATM to be an efficient and safely operated uh, uh, system uh, and your success is our success as well. Uh, so I would really encourage um, the various stakeholders to, uh, to, to, to cooperate and orchestrate efforts here uh, to, uh, to get better outcomes uh, from the system. Thank you very much. As you know, there's a specific panel dealing with innovation and technology in ATM later in the afternoon. So it, it's clear a very rich subject there to, to debate. Uh, and I would like now to move to the last one on my list here, safety, of course, safety in ATM. It's, it's a tagline for this uh, panel. And since ever, we were keen on improving safety. This was the driver for us. And it brought us where we are. Uh, we have challenges, but overall, aviation in Europe and in ATM is safe in good times and not so good times. And I will have uh, a bit of a polemic question, perhaps also coming from, from Yaza. Are we safe enough? Or should we get even safer and, and how can we do that building on this resilient and ultra safe system that we perhaps we have built so far? Arndt. Yeah, maybe let me start with um, this, this very good question. Are, you, are we safe enough? What we have seen of course in the last month, uh, some uh, rusty actors, let, let me say, in the sky. Um, uh, uh, creating in incidents um, where it, it, is, it becomes clear that uh, we are never safe enough. So safety is, has to be uh, in our DNA. Uh, we developed a, a strategy with the name aviation is our passion and safety is in our DNA and this has to be uh, absolutely the case. I think um, talking about technology and uh, decarbonization and new systems, new propulsion, we need to be realistic um, how fast things can be changed without uh, endanger safety. We, we have seen, you know, with the cat catastrophes uh, around the 737 MAX, where new technologies or improved technologies have led to a catastrophe. So it, it means uh, we cannot make any advantages in our systems. Uh, everything what we are doing needs to be mature. Maturity is of utmost importance. So um, uh, if, um, if we consider safety and on the other side, the, the tremendous need really to change uh, technologies uh, to, to, uh, to reduce our car carbon footprint, uh, we need to be realistic and I think we need to tell also um, politicians and in the public what is really um, possible. Yeah, I think SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, um, is um, of course the, is, uh, could be available uh, if we would have the, the, the right um, factories to produce it. Um, but uh, doing other experiments uh, with not proven technologies uh, would endanger safety. So I think this is something what we need to, uh, to align and to bring in line. Josef. Um, I agree. I, I think safety is never um, kind of a snapshot. I think safety is a moving target. I mean, the operating circumstances of the industry uh, keep changing and you have to deliver a safe operation uh, under any circumstances and you have to keep adopting and you have to keep improving as the environment around you uh, is, uh, is changing. 
but if I look at uh, the safety performance of the industry, I think it's pretty good. I mean, uh, we all can be very proud of uh, what has been achieved, and especially uh, you, gentlemen, um, you have delivered a system very, uh, very safely. I think we can debate more on the efficiency of that uh, and how much it costs and how various other issues are arising from that. Uh, but if I, look, if, if I look at it from a safety perspective, I think this industry is very safe. Uh, people can come and fly and they should feel very safe and probably they take a bigger risk uh, when they step out on the street and something falls on their head um, uh, accidentally. So I think we are working for a safe industry, but we should never sit back because uh, uh, we are in an ever-changing environment and uh, the changes impose uh, new uh, challenges on the industry and we need to cope with them and we need to be in the forefront of all these developments. Uh, uh, but I'm co quite confident that given the uh, uh, the, uh, the governance of the industry and the commitment of people and, 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 and the intellectual capacity and the professional capabilities inside the industry that we're going to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, to cope with that. Uh, the real question in my mind is that, you know, how do you maintain your safety performance on a going forward basis uh, without pushing back on some of the other elementary initiatives uh, the industry needs to transition on, uh, like decarbonization, like digitalization, like integration and those sort of issues. Thank you. Alessio, as a safety regulator, yeah, are we I, safe enough? I agree with what has been said uh, till now. Uh, we can have a common starting point, of course, aviation is safe, no matter of that. How can we improve uh, uh, safety? It's hard to answer, of course, because uh, uh, we are uh, in a very, very good level of safety today. But uh, as told also by, by, by Joseph, we haven't to forget that even maintaining uh, the present level of safety is a commitment from all of us. And uh, it could be considered the maintaining of the present situation as uh, a, a real success. Then, of course, uh, we have in front of us a lot of channel new challenges uh, where safety uh, needs to be considered like in a normal avi commercial aviation as a paramount. So all the activities related to the so-called new technologies and development of new technologies, uh, I uh, told before briefly something about uh, the urban mobility or the suborbital flights uh, or the high, uh, high, high air operations and so on. All these new developments uh, need to be tackled with the new concept of safety, which is need to be developed uh, uh, from a technical point of view, of course, uh, but even from a regulatory point of view, because all the operators need to have a clear frame in front of them in order to be sure that the level of safety in the normal uh, aviation activities uh, at least will remain as it is today. In the new ones, uh, will uh, uh, be uh, built uh, to reach the same level of safety we have today in the commercial operations. Then, uh, just uh, as a... As a a short uh, indication, uh, even uh, again, uh, uh, Patrick, sorry for naming you uh, so, so, so many times to, to, to this, this morning, but uh, Patrick mentioned during the Rome conference uh, the uh, general aviation package launched by, by EASA. This is probably a, a field where we can imagine mutualing, mutualizing the uh, uh, commercial uh, safety aspect uh, to improve safety in the sense. We can work uh, in the sense in improving, improving safety in one part of aviation, which is the so-called uh, recreational uh, aviation, which is uh, part of the general uh, aviation one, uh, including uh, all the actors, including the controllers, uh, which sometimes does not uh, present, of course, in smaller uh, airports, but, that to, to, but where tomorrow they could be involved a little bit more throughout the new systems. I'm thinking, for instance, to the so-called uh, remote tower control. We could be in, uh, in future govern also activities in smaller airports where there is no possibility even for costly, of course, uh, 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 situations. Uh, it's not possible to uh, have uh, physical presence of controllers uh, in, in those infrastructures. So we have a lot of areas where safety could be improved, uh, even we are in a situation where luckily safety is a, a real uh, uh, add value for us, uh, 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 not only in Europe, of course. And Frederick, 
your controllers are delivering safety on a daily basis? Well, yes, but it's uh, a continuous uphill battle. I mean, uh, for sure, the controllers will never take safety for granted. So now that we are, as we mentioned several times, uh, the various uh, new developments and technology, we have to be extremely careful because um, the uh, advent of new technologies, uh, we are not necessarily building up on the tried and experienced uh, safety logic that we are familiar with. So it's a machine is not transparent and uh, we have to make sure that uh, if we do not understand what the machine is doing, uh, that we need to be able to intervene still because we are still in a human-centered system. So we can deal with technology, we have to deal with te technology, we have to push for the transformation, but for this and during this transition, we will need a very strong uh, body, uh, safety body to assist us uh, in, this, uh, in this transformation because we cannot afford to see the, um, the whole infrastructure at one stage uh, blocked for safety issues um, or for other issues like cyber uh, security as we mentioned before. So again, the air traffic controllers are taking a high pride on providing the highest uh, level of, uh, of safety with the highest standard possible in Europe and I'm very uh, pleased, but I will never be content and never stand on, on that to say that uh, it's taken for granted. We always have to improve and we always have to look in it. And in this context, obviously, just culture is extremely important to be able to learn from the incidents, to learn from our mistake and to make sure that the operators feel totally open to describe and to, to document uh, what has happened in, a, in an incident and they need to be somehow protected as well um, from general mistakes uh, that have happened so that we can continuously improve, improve, improve the safety levels. Thank you very much and thank you all for, for the very good answers to this uh, yeah, polemic uh, question. Certainly um, we, we are not safe enough, our work is never done. And as we heard it from the MEP Marinescu, the, the political discussion around aviation is getting more and more complex. And perhaps safety is no longer the top of the other agenda. Uh, but at the same time, we need to, to keep in mind that this calls for work is not to be taken for granted. It's happening every day. And there is expectation from the traveling public, of course, that safety is at the highest standard. And of course, one of the, let's say, the, the challenges to safety is complexity. And now since we're moving to take a few questions from the floor, I see them coming. There's a common theme that is, is there addressing um, fragmentation. Fragmentation as a measure of complexity of the European ATM system. Uh, and it seems to be there's consensus in this panel that we should work and, and solve this problem once for all. Uh, but the questions coming from the floor is how should we do it? Not whether we should do it. I think here everybody's on the same page. But, and the past history is not really helping us. How are we really doing it? Mm -hmm. Aren't? Yeah, maybe, maybe let me start um, with that. Um, first of all, and uh, Josef mentioned that, uh, it needs a political will. Yeah, I think this is, um, this is clear without um, um, having um, politicians uh, really standing behind that and pushing that, it will not happen because uh, we have this military integration and we have this national views and national uh, egoisms, uh, of course, as well. Um, so we need in Europe um, the political will to, uh, to, 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 to work on, on, on that uh, issue. I don't, um, I don't think that, uh, you know, centralization is, uh, is a solution overall. So we need, to, um, we need to, to look, as I mentioned that, that um, we have, uh, you know, in different airspaces. And uh, if you take the approach, if you take, you know, uh, around the tower systems, around the airports, where you ever have typical uh, 
uh, topographies, uh, which needs to be considered, it's uh, something different than the upper airspace. And I think the upper airspace could be a very good uh, field to, uh, to, uh, to collaborate much better and much more as it is done today. And um, I mentioned MUAC, so Maastricht upper airspace control could be a very good example to be extended. Um, uh, let's start maybe with such an initiative, but again, it needs a political will. And Frederick, you, you're MUAC and, and it worked. Uh, why is not being replicated elsewhere? Well, uh, I mean, this, this is very sweet to my ears to, to hear what Anne uh, is saying. And um, I'm looking forward. We might have a different idea on the institutional status of uh, this endeavor, but uh, definitely this is the way forward. We, I mentioned before that defragmentation was very high on our agenda for many years because we also see that uh, nowadays with the impact on climate, and the, the efforts that we all have to do and improve even further the performance, then we should also look at what is existing at the moment and what is delivering. And let's build on what uh, exists in the system and has been uh, has had proven records for decades of the highest performance in Europe and build on these, on these models in order to go forward. We all need to go forward together in order to deliver what the airlines are asking, but mainly we need to embark into a stable, um, greener, digital, customer-oriented base uh, system, mm -hmm. because we owe it to the passenger mm -hmm. and we also owe it to the citizen in Europe. And like you mentioned, and I fully agree, it is a political uh, will that we need to be able to embark on this, because as we have discussed, and we have had many discussions in the past uh, within the industry, we see that there is a need, but the need is even more, um, you know, it needs to happen now because we cannot, we cannot continuously delay this. Um, we maybe have missed a previous crisis opportunity. We have tackled the wrong uh, issues rather than actually uh, tackling the main issue, which is fragmentation. We have tried to put patches. Now let's get together and embark into solving the issue. Thank you, Frederick. I agree with you. We should never miss this opportunity of this big crisis. Another question coming from the floor, and this will be for, for, both for Arndt and for Josef, because it mentions that uh, the safety challenge is getting back to the old traffic levels and whether when repressurizing the system, so to say, the, let's say the previous weak areas, the previous cracks will perhaps give up or give in. Uh, and how, what have you been do doing to avoid that uh, those, let's say, area of, of safety exposures are not leading to adverse safety impacts when ramping up your operations as an airline or an SP? I think we've been seeing challenges at all levels, no matter which uh, kind of part of the uh, of the chain uh, you, you are you are into. I mean, as uh, as Arne said, that uh, you know we became rusty. I mean, uh, we kind of think that. Uh, Stopping an airline is easy and it's going to be equally easy to, uh, to restart the airline, but it's a totally different challenge. Restarting a business is posing a 10 times or 20, 20 times bigger challenge for any uh, businesses. And I'm pretty sure this is not only applicable for airlines, but, uh, but any, any kind of uh, uh, businesses. I mean, one of the issues I'm foreseeing is that uh, this may not happen uh, to the industry for the last time. I mean, disruptions like this could reoccur. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with kind of uh, operational um, incapacitation of the industry, if you want to put it, uh, put it that way, which has never been really happening to the, uh, to the industry over the last 100 years? I mean, maybe the biggest disruption we had was the uh, Icelandic volcano um, ten, 10 years ago, and, and maybe this is the new norm. And how do you deal with that? How do you uh, deal with the challenge of, uh, of stopping and restarting um, uh, uh, business or industries or seg segments of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the industries? I mean, we are definitely uh, learning a lot from, uh, from the last 18 months. Uh, 
to be totally honest, uh, we totally underestimated the challenge. I personally totally under underestimated the challenge uh, we were dealing with. I mean, luckily nothing happened and we have been safe throughout the whole period because we, uh, uh, we have always put safety first and we have a trust culture and we let people make mistakes and we try to learn from those mistakes as opposed to retaliate uh, those mistakes. So these are very important principles for uh, uh, running the, uh, uh, the business. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that this kind of an operational incapacitation uh, might just be a reoccurring theme in the industry going forward and it is posing very significant uh, uh, challenges from a, from a safety perspective. And also as discussed, uh, um, a cyber security uh, will uh, challenge us, uh, is challenging us uh, already again. Uh, luckily, we have not been exposed uh, overly, uh, but we are not immune. I mean, we are seeing attacks happening on our system on a, a fairly frequent basis. I mean, so far, our kind of defense has been strong enough to, uh, to push back, back on that. Um, and then we were talking about a lot of new technologies coming. So I think, yeah, I mean, we're going uh, to be challenged. And uh, I think the, the real answer to the, uh, to the question is that we simply just need to be in the forefront of these, uh, of these issues. We have to anticipate what's coming, and we have to define ourselves against those uh, projected um, um, uh, times and, and, and challenges properly um, in a natural and proactive way. Thank you. Um, Frederick? Yeah, if, if I may actually, as we're coming uh, close to an end, I would like to mention the fact that next year, 2022, uh, we will celebrate 100 years of uh, ATC. So let us all look forward together to um, developing this, uh, this beautiful industry and this beautiful sector um, to become greener, but also to make sure that we do it with a new spirit and um, um, that we create great opportunities for everyone and that we get the political uh, world with us to understand what we need in order to deliver for these citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid where uh, our time is up. It's a, it's a very rich domain. We can continue for the next three hours. Also, the, the questions keep coming. I'm afraid we cannot take them all. It's, it's the moment to, to move on. Uh, to, to attempt a, a very quick wrap up, um, we, we are safe. We were proven to remain safe during these difficult times, but the work is, is never done. It's only getting more complex, more complicated. Perhaps being prepared for disruption is something that we have to add to our safety DNA. Things will never or not always go according to plan. So building on our resilience and agility, uh, and agility will, will be an, a priority for us getting out of this crisis. Fragmentation, I think here is uh, absolute agreement on all levels that this is um, a route for inefficiency and is increasing our safety exposure that can bring a lot of benefits, uh, of course, when it comes to safety. Uh, that technology in itself could come to our rescue, but technology has to be proven first. It has not to be a scope in itself, but it has to be there to, to show its added value and to show that it's safe. We need to be mindful that when we have embraced technology, we've done this in a, in a way that allows uh, us to, to achieve this very high safety level because there could be risk also built in, in technology as we discussed about cyber. And of course, we need to make sure that as we go ahead to remember that aviation will remain an industry of people and that they will play the most uh, prevalent role in uh, being at the heart of that industry, also from a safety perspective. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the panel uh, and the, the discussion. I want to, to thank the panelists for, for their time and for sharing their, their views and um, ideas on this uh, very important topic. Uh, this concludes the first panel of the day and I'm handing over back to Janet. So thank you very much, Edouard. I'm sorry we have to cut you off here. It was really a very interesting panel. We're taking a short break now. We need to be back about 11.35. Thank you. <laughs>